Hey folks, I'm Demotro. Welcome back to Combo Class, where today I want to tell you a little like marker, a mystery about the number 10. This mystery relates to a type of number known as friendly numbers and another type known as solitary numbers and in general relates to looking at the divisors or factors of a number, like the things that can cleanly divide 10, the positive integers that can do that are one, two, five, and 10. And sometimes we may look at how many of those there are, like there are four in this case, or sometimes we might look at what those add up to, like one plus two plus five plus 10 would be 18 in this case. But it turns out that this is level one of a particular function. This is level zero. And this mystery takes place on the negative first level. This function called a divisor function, or sum of positive divisors function, signified with the lowercase Greek letter sigma, a little subscript that I was calling the level, and a number here. And this is an arithmetic function, meaning that this number n can be any positive integer or whole number bigger than zero, and there will be just one output, which funny enough is defined involving the uppercase Greek letter sigma, meaning to take the sum of some things, in this case the positive divisors of n, each to the power of that subscript z. The first level is sort of the default in that if you see this lowercase sigma and some number, we'll say 10, without a subscript, it implies that the subscript is secretly one, or we're on level one, as I was saying, which just means to add up each of the positive divisors to the first power, just giving you a general sum of the divisors, which does have a lot of cool traits. And in an earlier episode, we talked about what's called aliquot sums, where you add up the proper divisors of a number or positive divisors apart from itself, which we can define here too. If you take level one of some number minus the number itself, that ends up giving you just the divisors apart from itself remaining, or that trait called the aliquot sum we saw earlier, which created tons of families of fun nicknames. But we don't need to just stay on level one. And if you first heard about this and knew that you could move your level number, you might think, ooh, it sounds powerful and exciting to try level two or three. And yeah, you can learn some interesting things on level two, where you add up the squares of a number's divisors, or on level three, where you add up the cubes, or level four and beyond. But the most interesting things don't happen when we go upward in level number but rather when we go downward, like to level zero. Level zero of a number, like 10 for example here, takes each of the positive divisors to the zeroth power and adds those up. And any whole number to the zeroth power equals one. So here we have one plus one plus one plus one equals four. And for any number on level zero, we'll have one plus one plus one plus etc. for the amount of positive divisors it has. In other words, tallying up or counting how many positive divisors there are. So taking the sum of a number's divisors can be important. Counting how many divisors there are can be important. And both of those are just different subscripts, or I was calling level numbers, of the same function. So if both of those are so important, what about going lower, like to level negative one? Level negative one of a number is important enough that it has a nickname 
called the abundancy index of the number. And it does mean to add up each of the divisors to the negative first power, but it can also be simplified into neater forms. And to see what I mean, let's use an example. Like if we were looking at the abundancy index of six, well, that is the negative first level of this divisor function. So we could call it the divisors of six, one, two, three in itself, each to the negative first power added up. And the negative first power of a positive integer like that is its reciprocal, one divided by itself. But this isn't the simplest form we can put this in. We can see the abundancy index of a number as the sum of the reciprocals of its positive divisors. But we could also imagine what would happen if we tried to give these a common denominator and turn this into one fraction. Well, this one would turn into six sixths. This one would turn into three sixths. This one would turn into two sixths. And that one already is one sixths. And what, now that they have the common denominator, we can see an interesting symmetry here. Here we had one. Here we had the number itself. And here we had the divisors going upward there and downward there in a sort of symmetrical way. And when this all comes together, it makes a numerator of one plus two plus three plus six over six. So here, the abundancy index could have been calculated by adding up the reciprocals of the divisors, which gives us two, or by adding up the divisors, like we had just taken the level one sum of it, and then dividing by the number itself. Sorry that the sixes look so much like the sigmas. And in any case, these all give us two, the abundancy index of six. The abundancy index can be approached a few ways. And to see that a little clearer, let's look at a number with a few more divisors. Let's say 12. 12 has these six divisors. And if we add up their reciprocals, we would get seven thirds or, you know, two point infinite threes. But we can also get there another method without having to add up all of the divisor reciprocals. Because when we give them common denominators, their order flips and repeats, sort of like six did. We have one as the numerator up there, 12 the number itself as the denominator down there. And here, having all the divisors going in different directions. One, two, three, four, six, 12. One, two, three, four, six, 12. As a larger example, if we looked at the abundancy index of 36, we could calculate that by adding up all of its divisor reciprocals. But if we turn that into one fraction, when we get to the common denominator stage, we see that divisor list in reverse. And that happens because the factors of a number come in beautiful pairs. One times 36 is the same as two times 18 or three times 12 or four times nine, six times itself and etc. And that lets us calculate this abundancy index in an alternate way, adding up all of the divisors in reverse, but with addition, the order doesn't matter, and dividing by the number itself. And it's true that the abundancy index of a number can also be calculated by doing the first level of its divisor sum divided by itself. So this abundancy index could also be described as how many times bigger is a number's divisor sum compared to itself. And that leads us to some nicknames for numbers we've met before, like abundant numbers, which could be described as numbers that have their proper divisors add up to more than themselves, or their aliquot sums bigger than themselves, or all their divisors add up to more than twice themselves, or could be described as the numbers who have an abundancy index greater than two. Deficient numbers is the name for numbers that have their aliquot sum less than themselves, 
or in other words, all their divisors add up to less than twice themselves, or in other words, have an abundancy index less than two. And right in the middle are the numbers that have an abundancy index exactly equal to two, six, as well as 28 have the trait where if you add up the reciprocals of their divisors, or if you add up their divisors divided by themselves, you get two. And numbers with that trait are known as perfect numbers. The next being 496, and it's still unknown mathematically if there's an infinite amount of perfect numbers or not, and each of them has a formula we've shown in the past that links them to what are called Mersenne primes, the largest primes ever discovered by humanity. Perfect numbers are often defined by being numbers where all their divisors apart from themselves add up to exactly themselves, or could be defined as numbers where all their divisors add up to exactly twice themselves. But I like to look at them as the numbers here that have exactly an abundancy index of two. These perfect numbers are considered quite important by number theorists, but on the scale of looking at abundancy indices, they're really two perfect numbers because there's something called multi-perfect numbers that includes these as well as others. These added up to an abundancy index of exactly two, but we could also look at things like three perfect, also known as tri-perfect numbers, where the abundancy index is exactly three. These are the only six triperfect numbers known to humanity. It's unknown if there's any others. Each of these numbers has the trait where if you either add up all of its divisors and then divide by itself, you get three, or if you add up the negative first power or reciprocal of each of the divisors, you also get that three. And multi-perfect numbers in general are families of numbers that have an abundancy index that's a whole number. Now, although to be called a multi-perfect number, you'd need to have a whole number for your abundancy index, there are other families of numbers that share an abundancy index with each other. For example, the number 30, if we calculate this, we get 2.4. That's the simplified form of either adding up the reciprocals of all the divisors or all the divisors divided by the number itself. And if we do that with 140, we get the same 2.4 answer. And numbers that share an abundancy index with at least one other number are known as friendly numbers. Whereas the numbers that share an abundancy index with no other numbers and keep their abundancy index just to themselves are known as solitary numbers. Sometimes it can be hard to know if a number's friendly, like the number 24 has an abundancy index of exactly two and a half making it what's known as a hemi-perfect number, numbers with a half-integer abundancy index. But as far as numbers whose abundancy index is exactly two and a half, if you check the first million numbers, you wouldn't find any. And you might think that 24 might be solitary. But nope, 24 is friendly, with its smallest friend being this number. However, some numbers have been proven to be solitary. In fact, any number n where it and its level one divisor sum are co-prime or have no factors larger than one in common, or in other words, this fraction, which represents its abundancy index, 
is already as simplified as it can be, and there's no further simplified form of that fraction to create, is guaranteed to have n be a solitary number. For example, any prime number will be solitary because if we look at this form of expressing its abundancy index, we get one more than the prime because one and the prime are the only divisors divided by the prime, which will already be in simplified form with the numerator and denominator being co-prime, and thus making that number solitary. For example, seven has an abundancy index of eight sevenths, which no other number has. And this also will work for any other number, like eight, for example, that has no factors bigger than one in common with its divisor sum. In that case, 15 compared to eight. 15 eighths is also in simplified form with those having no factors larger than one in common, making eight also solitary. There are also numbers like 18 that aren't co-prime with their divisor sum, yet have been proven to be solitary. Like 18's level one divisor sum is 39, and 39 eighteenths could simplify to 13 sixths. Yet mathematicians have proven that no other number has an abundancy index that simplifies to 13 sixths, and thus 18 is solitary. So some numbers have been proven to be friendly, some are proven to be solitary, and some that status is unknown. And here's a chart with the first 24 numbers, their abundancy index, rounded off to thousandths if they go beyond that, and their status as to whether they are friendly, like six or 12, or 24, where another number shares that abundancy index, or if they've been proven to be solitary, whether with that co-prime method or another technique. All these ones with orange dots have been proven that no other number has their exact abundancy index. Or the ones with the purple dot that I use to signify unknown, Numbers that we don't know if they're friendly or solitary. The smallest of which being 10. 10 has an abundancy index of 1.8. 1.8 is the result of adding 1 over 1 plus 1 half plus a fifth and a tenth. Or could be seen as how many times bigger 10's divisors is compared to itself. And it's unknown if any other numbers have that same abundancy index, making 10 the smallest number that its friendly or solitary status is unknown. So who knows if or when we'll know if the number 10 is friendly or is solitary. And it's funny, because living in a base 10 society and having 10 fingers, the number 10 is actually a bit overrated. Being two times five isn't the coolest thing about it. As we'll see in later episodes, it is triangular and tetrahedral and happens to be the smallest number that this trait is unknown for. Thanks for joining me to learn some numbers. Carla, I think we should get this thing out. And a special thanks to my cats, as well as to the squirrels who have been visiting. Here's a clip of me feeding a nut to one the other day. And special thanks to all the humans who have been supporting on places like Patreon. Love you all. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.